Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar today on the topic of how machine vibration signatures help to detect early failures. Um, this is a 45 minutes long presentation and probably will have 10 to 15 minutes at the end to take any questions. Uh, please feel free to type in the questions as you go through this presentation and uh, we'll, uh, I'll try to answer them as the time permits. Uh, by the way, my name is Banu Srila, and I am the Director of Technical Marketing here at uh, Grace Engineered Products. Uh, I've been with Grace for about four and a half years, and I'm a certified uh, maintenance reliability professional, and also a certified leader for, uh, reliability leader from uh, reliabilityweb.com, and also electrical uh, safety compliance professional. Um, as for my background, I'm an electrical engineer. I've uh, been in this industry for about uh, 20 plus years, uh, mostly in power generation and uh, utility industry working with electrical control systems, switch gear, and uh, uh, motor control centers and such. Also, I'm a member of uh, UL uh, Standards Technical Panel for 508 and 508A for the industrial machinery. Um, with that, we'll just go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> please use your dashboard to type in the questions as you go through the presentation, and uh, I will try to answer them at the end. So the topic outline for today, uh, what is mechanical vibration and what causes the vibration in first place? And the second thing is the basic definitions, which are uh, pretty important when you look at the vibration analysis and signatures. And uh, we look at the vibration warning and its relation to the potential to failure curve or peak F curve. And uh, vibration analysis and band definitions. So this is the, the, there are wide band definitions of this vibration analysis. We'll just pick five, four or five faults at the max and try to go through them in detail. And lastly, we'll also touch on the uh, overview of uh, Grayson's a predictive maintenance system as well, okay? So again, I just wanna make a quick disclaimer. This is not a detailed vibration analysis uh, presentation. Uh, this is going to talk about few definitions and uh, how to look for the anomalies using uh, your uh, waveforms and time waveforms and uh, spectrum analysis, and then uh, make a determination from there. So if you want a detailed uh, a vibration training, you need to go and take the uh, different levels of vibration uh, analyst trainings that's offered by the training institutes, okay? So what is vibration? So it's uh, basically a repetitive back and forth motion, um, a motion that repeats itself. So when disturbed from the equilibrium, um, the resisting force acts towards the equilibrium and that's what creates this vibration or the oscillation in the simple form. So simple harmonic motion is a great example <clears throat> for that, okay? So what causes vibration? So vibration um, transfers from in an industrial setting, it transfers from a shaft to a bearing to the casing or the motor housing, for example. It converts uh, vibration, it can go from down, up to down, or it can go from side to side, and also it can go from uh, end to end as well. So what you're seeing here is two shafts coupled together, one end to the driving end and one end to the driven end. So when these things are misaligned or if there is a problem, what you're seeing here is a time waveform, one shows uh, the frequency, which is uh, uh, amplitudes are the, are the peaks, and the frequency is the rotation, what you see here. The spectrum is normally generated from a waveform, and uh, each component generates a single frequency. Take an example of a motor coupled to a pump. It has a multiple elements, multiple components, for example. It has the motor shaft, it has the coupling, it has the bearings, and also it has the uh, pump has the uh, propeller or the impellers and such. Okay, so when these things are connected together, it's making a spectrum which each source of the vibration uh, and this spectrum will make it easy to see this, okay? And lastly, harmonics and sidebands tells us that the motion uh, is more complex and that's how we try to uh, look through this time waveforms or the spectrum analysis and determine what those are. And uh, <clears throat> the one I'm showing on top of this, the blue casing here is basically a vibration sensor so uh, the different types and different forms. Um, so this basically converts the vibration into electrical signal, right? So that you guys probably know there are like the, the probes, the ones, uh, PHO sensors, and they're like the MEMS sensors. Those are more like the wireless based and the low end models. Um, these are all the different types available in the market, but basically a sensor converts vibration into an electrical signal, okay? So why vibration monitoring is important as we see it now, right? So motor, motor load imbalance and any type of the uh, downtimes as a re result of the chaotic shutdowns, right? So those are the reasons why we see this vibration monitoring predominantly important in industry 
uh, because we're also looking at a lot of retired workforce and we don't have the right knowledge or the people to take care of these tasks as well. So the bearing falls is another example that we would like to monitor using the vibration sensors and the looseness and the fastness. This is more so on uh, the foundation bolts of those machines. When they're, uh, when they're anchored down to those foundations, the looseness of these fasteners can result to uh, structural uh, vibration or a rotational vibration as well, right? And the last one, uh, two things we're looking at is the broken motor rotor bars. So misalignment of the shafts or the couplings can also lead to excessive stress on the uh, rotor of the motor, electrical, electric motors, which could cause a mechanical, sorry, electrical fault within that system as well. And lastly, misalignment of the drivetrain, like the rotor, bearing shaft, and the coupling of load, these things can lead to a chaotic shutdowns if things are not being noticed at the right time, okay? <clears throat> so most vibration, machine vibration health sim symptoms occur in the range of zero to four kilohertz frequency range. And uh, these vibrations occur over an acceleration amplitude range, uh, which varies between a few milli Gs up to as much as uh, 16 Gs. Okay, these are basically um, acceleration and the amplitude I'm talking about, which will go in the uh, next few slides. So this chart shows a typical uh, maintenance approach. Uh, to just make it simple, I just uh, uh, put this condition-based, preventive, and reactive, or the three categories of this maintenance approaches and the time on your x-axis, right? If you look at this, the top one, which is the reactive one, you run the equipment and you don't have any kind of uh, predictive uh, approach in place. So the equipment uh, goes down and then you perform an unplanned maintenance task and then it comes back to run condition and then it goes on, right? So basically you don't do any kind of approach. You just basically sit until the equipment shuts down and then you go and perform the maintenance. So if you look at this dollar signs associated to this unplanned, they show three dollar signs, which means basically a high impact on your cost. So whenever this downtime occurs, you're spending a lot of money and a lot of resources um, not to take into consideration the productivity loss as well, right? And the next one is a preventive maintenance where I'm showing after installation, the equipment runs, and then you have the downtime where in this case, you're planning this downtime. So is that could be a manufacturer recommended guidelines or it could be based on your uh, uh, maintenance schedules and so, so you perform this maintenance and taking down the equipment for that specific period of time, and then you perform the maintenance, and then the equipment runs and you go on the same cycle. So I'm trying a two dollar science because you may end up spending too much money or too little money when you uh, try to put these things in place because you don't know exactly when this is going to fail. Additionally, I would like to highlight on that point that whenever you try to perform a maintenance and there is no need, you're trying to add an additional point of risk as well, because you need to make sure that the equipment is put back in the original condition, which you don't know every time when you're trying to take it down and put it back, okay? And the last one I'm showing is a condition based, which we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, as the products, what we offer and the new other products in the market as well. It's more like a continuous monitoring and measurement, right? So these devices will give you an opportunity to look for all this trends over time and the patterns of these machines on the vibration, for example, and then you make a corrective action based off of that. So you basically go and touch this piece of equipment based on the specific trend, not just on a regular basis. So in that case, you are extending the operational life of the equipment as you look at this long stretch, the run stretch on the condition base that goes um, to a long time, and then you perform a planned maintenance taking into consideration what those additional measures are uh, showing um, on this uh, trend chart. So by that way, you can thoroughly plan for your resources, you can plan for your uh, uh, spares and such, and then you can do it at the most cost-effective fashion. So the three things I would like to show just because to give you more view to set a context around this, okay? Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> So this is most uh, popular curve, which is a potential to failure curve or a PF curve. So in this, we look at in a pump motor application, there is a failure, which is shown in the bottom side here, and there's a functional failure, which is F0, F1, and then the equipment condition. So once you start the equipment, once you commission the equipment, install the equipment, you have the potential zero, which is the vibration changes. So P0 is one of the major indicators of early warning signs. So if you see any kind of 
changes to your uh, vibration signatures automatically, you need to be understanding that there is something that's going on. And having it uh, monitored over a period of time gives you the ability to take that corrective action without uh, damaging the equipment as well. So, and then if you look at the P1, which is more like an oil debris, and then the P2, more so of a thermography to look for the heat signatures, and then uh, P3, preventive maintenance, where you do the routine maintenance for that, and then the P4 is audible noise. So the reason why I showed the F4, F1 here is basically functional failure is a situation where the system is not performing to its designed functional levels, okay? So it's not uh, giving the output as it's designed to. And then the failure, failure on the bottom one and the time zero, what, what you're showing is basically there's nothing happening to that machine. So F0, F1 could be efficiency issues or it could be uh, energy conservations and such, but F failure directly states this is not running anymore, okay? So in the same application, if you go to the next level, early detection is like a one to nine months, what you show here from P to P2. That's kind of a time what you're trying to monitor using those vibration signatures or ultrasounds, and then trying to make a determination whether you need to make that maintenance activity. So the good example is not only just look at those vibration signatures alone, then combine that vibration along with uh, the variations of the temperature, surface temperature, or the current drop of the motor, and also take into consideration the frequency drops and the voltage fluctuations that piece of equipment is showing, and then make the determination. So in that way, you are getting more, um, you're getting the best value for the bug by means of just performing the right task by grouping them together to get it done all at one time than just doing it uh, on a one-off basis, okay? So <clears throat> what is vibration analysis? So vibration analysis is simply put a process of finding out what forces correlate with the fault frequencies found the data plat plots, okay? Time wave or spectrum, we call it here. So it basically combines the phase angle, the time domain and spectrum together. Um, and when you talk about the vibration, you're talking about the acceleration, uh, amplitude and the displacement as well. The frequencies such as the bearing faults, gear mesh and the blade pass. So these can be calculated using the basic uh, uh, waveforms and then doing some mathematical formula formulas using it and you can get an output needed, so to figure it out. But frequencies for the bearing faults and gear mesh are much more complicated than the normal ones because those are uh, only monitored the high frequency levels, okay, which requires the high frequency sensing methods as well, okay? Let's go to the next slide. So vibration analysis, uh, rotating machines vibrate when operating, so uh, overall machine condition related to shaft speed, which is a low frequency faults, primarily we're talking about here. When there is a bearing condition or a gearbox fault, we specifically say it's a high frequency fault, okay? So we also need to separate more vibration sources, something like uh, unbalance uh, of the foundations or a misalignment between the shafts or a fan blade fault, which is more like uh, uh, the blade pass, we call it, and also the gear mesh faults. So when you look at all this, uh, different elements of this vibration uh, time waveforms or a spectrum analysis, you'll be able to look at all these details thoroughly to make the determination and what is really faulting that specific system, okay? So forces of vibration, we talked about uh, different types, so we can narrow it down to two buckets. One is internal and the other one is external. The internal is, which you can't see, which is more like the bearing or a gear mesh or electrical, which is a rotor bar misalignment. On the external side, you can look at the looseness of the couplings or the imbalance um, of the foundation or a misalignment between, between the shafts or the friction between the uh, two mechanical components as well, okay? So what are some of the benefits, uh, sorry, basic definitions of vibration? Um, so vibration displacement. So vibration displacement is pretty much the total travel of vibrating object or a component, okay? So this is measured in mils or microns. Uh, so typically, these are the speeds which are less than 10 hertz. So primarily, you can detect this using the sensors like a PHR electric or other ones what we showed. You need to have ID current probes which will measure the displacement. So for the discussions of the topic and the products we'll be talking in this uh, presentation, we'll confine our measurements more so on a velocity and acceleration, okay? So velocity is the speed of vibrating object or a component that is typically measured as uh, peak speed or an RMS speed, okay? So this, uh, is this is measured in 
um, inches per second or millimeters per second in metric. So velocity measures are not highly frequency dependent. So I told you about the bearing failures or the gear mesh failures before. So those are definitely uh, frequency dependent. You need to have a high frequency um, accelerometers for you to uh, measure those. Whereas in this, the uh, velocity uh, method, you can use uh, velocity measures are not just a, they can use it from five to 5,000 hertz as your uh, frequency range, okay? So and then you go to the uh, vibration acceleration. So which is an acceleration measure, uh, the, the rate of change of velocity of the vibration object is measured in Gs of acceleration, okay? So this is what we're talking about, the high frequency stuff, which is over mostly 5,000 hertz, okay? And the next one is conditions such as the turbulence and cavitation are also much easier to detect using the high frequency methods, okay? So the next one is what is overall vibration? So this is a measure of vibration through the entire spectrum, right? It takes into consideration all the different waveforms and then gives a complete layer of a single waveform that shows you a different frequencies built into it. And then the next one is a peak. Peak is used to describe the amplitude. We talked about the frequency and the amplitude, the two important measures when you look at these waveforms. The peak is used to describe the amplitude of the vibration units where the max energy is applied. So peak is used uh, in the units of velocity and also acceleration. The next definition is a peak to peak, which is primarily used to describe the amplitude of the vibrations where maximum energy from the vibration is displayed. So used with the units of displacement. And the next two are pretty important, which is the radial and axial. So radial is a directional measurements which are perpendicular to the central line of the machine's rotating shaft, okay? That is the radial, which is the upward or the downward. And then the axial is a directional measurement in line with the central line of the rotating shaft, which is parallel to the shaft is what it is, right? And then the last one on the slide is the harmonics, which is more like the multiples of the forcing frequency, such as uh, running speed. Okay, let's go to the next slide. We have uh, some more definitions. So RMS, uh, normally we've seen this waveforms in the calculations, which is a root mean square value. Uh, RMS is 0.707 times the peak value, and it provides the square root of the average of the data samples that's been collected within the time waveform. And the resonance is one of the things that's important because when the, when the machine vibration frequency coincides at uh, near frequency of the machine component, right, then the natural frequency can be excited into the resonant state. So the vibration ampl amplitude in that specific frequency can uh, trigger 10 to 30 times of the machine vibration itself. So you need to be really uh, watching this resonant frequency as well, okay? And the order is the one thing that when you look at this time waveforms or uh, 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 spectrum forms, so you need to look at the order is a speed unit, which is a one times running speed of the shaft. So we talk about one X, two X, three X, different uh, bands on it. So that's what it means. And then the bent shaft is a condition where a permanent bonus is caused due to vibration because this bow is indicated with a one X vibration and it's not reduced to the acceptable levels when the balancing is done. So sometimes you look at this waveforms and you perform this uh, balancing acts on these machines, and sometimes that should not resolve this problem because that has a bent shaft condition, okay? So these are highly characterized by 1X and uh, 2X uh, frequencies. And the next one on the slide here is the Fmax, which is the highest frequency that's called uh, a fast Fourier transform analyzer, which will take that, and the Fmax is normally set at 3.25 to 3.5 times of the expected frequency of the specific machine. And then the F band or FTT, FFT band spectrum is a function of various frequencies along the x-axis. And uh, the next one is a misalignment. Misalignment occurs when the driving and the driven shafts in the mechanical train are not aligned, okay? So take an example of the motor and pump application, when the two things are not aligned properly, then you're gonna see this misalignment. And the natural frequencies is a term which is inherent in all objects. For example, when you hear, when you, uh, uh, the tone generated by a bell or when you uh, see an impact, when you hit something, that's what the natural frequencies that you'll come across. And the last one is pretty important, uh, specifically in a couple of applications on the high frequencies. Uh, which is a GSC or a spike energy. 
It's basically a signal processing function which is designed to measure the short duration pulses. So take an example of uh, a cavitation pump or a steam or an air leak um, in a fan. So you can look at all these things where you will see the spike energy uh, which will show you, that will tell you basically a fault or a condition that exists because of that uh, uh, specific condition on the cavitations end, okay? So 1x vibration, uh, the vibration frequency, as I told you before, it's uh, the speed of the rotating shaft, and the two times vibration is the twice the running speed, and the bench shaft we talked about. And the blade pass is one important definition because when you couple this shaft to an impeller or a fan, right, a turbine, for example, where you know the number of teeth on the specific rotor, right? You can look at the alignment of the blades to the outlet varies. So as each blade crosses the outlet, it obstructs the air, and uh, which causes a pressure at the outlet to vary. So this pressure creates a vibration signature, which can be captured using a pressure pulsation that occurs at that specific frequency equal to the number of blades. Um, this is, for example, a five-pass, uh, five, pass, uh, five uh, blade impeller will have a five blade pass frequency. And the next one is a cavitation, which occurs when the fluid intake of that specific pump is uh, having bubbles inside and the discharge will cause this uh, impeller blades to cavitate that could uh, damage the pump itself. That's something that you need to be uh, watchful for, okay? <clears throat> Let's take a quick look at types of faults we talk about. It. I mentioned we'll not be talking about several faults. We just confine this discussion to shaft misalignments, looseness, and also the bearing faults, okay? The first one is the shaft misalignment, which can be categorized into parallel or angular. And then the looseness can be two types. One is a structural, which is more like a foundation, or the rotational that could be because of the rotor imbalance, or it could be because of uh, the misalignment of the uh, couplings as well. And the last one on the list is bearing faults, which is more like a high frequency faults we talked about, which can detect the early, early bearing failures, okay? So this is a chart quickly that tells you the different types of vibration measurement as we talked about. So when you look at this on the top here, the low frequency vibration, which is more like the machine speed. Um, so you, these are the simple faults you can uh, figure out. One is unbalanced, misalignment, and mechanical looseness, okay? So this is all focus on the velocity measurement. So millimeter per second or inches per second. The frequency range for these are from 10 to 1000 Hertz. And as I mentioned, anything less than 10 Hertz, it's through this eddy current probes, which is for uh, very, very low frequency uh, detection. Okay, and the high frequency vibration and the natural frequency, which is related to natural frequency, which is more like a bearing faults or a gear mesh faults, you're looking at a measurement in acceleration, which is in Gs, okay? So the frequency range, as you see here, the major difference is it goes from 500 to 16,000 hertz, where most of these devices in the market at uh, the cost-effective manner can go somewhere between uh, 1,600 to uh, 5,000 hertz range, okay. okay? So this is something that you can look at. So if you look at, if you pick the vibration sensor, the frequency range is 10 to 1,000 hertz, you're only looking at the low-frequency vibration faults, Whereas if you look at the high, high frequency vibration, you need to be looking for something that's higher than uh, 1,000 hertz. Okay? And it can go up to 16,000 hertz, de depends upon the complexity of your specific uh, equipment and how you want to monitor and what you want to monitor as well. You can spend uh, thousands of dollars on just that, okay? Let's go to the next slide. So here's the uh, diagram that shows the shaft misalignments. As you look at this uh, misalignment here, one shows the parallel misalignment and one shows the angular misalignment, okay? So, so parallel mission, basically a condition where the center lines of the coupled shafts do not coincide. As you look at these two pictures, the center lines in these two shafts are not coincided, right? So the same thing is here. But this one is a parallel misalignment and the bottom one is an angular misalignment. So. With both these faults, that results in a premature bearing failures, which you want to avoid, right? You want to run this equipment for the long duration, so you want to avoid as much as possible on all these faults so that you can monitor the signatures ahead of time so that you have uh, a maintenance strategy in place before things shut down, okay? So misalignment is common due to the poor alignment practices or is it because of the thermal growth, right? So because of the heat that's dissipated from these uh, components as they are uh, 
running against. So this can transfer the heat, generate the heat, and it can transfer between the shafts, which can lead to the misalignment as well. So the vibration does not always change in a predictable ways uh, when shafts are misaligned. So what you see normally in these scenarios, as you look at the next slide, is the parallel misalignments, you can look at the 1x and the 2x. So there's the dominant 2x uh, sign here, and also on the angular, if you look at it, there's the 1x. So that's one of the major uh, things that will show you. One is a radial fault, one is an axial fault, as you look at this uh, two things on this picture here, okay? So when comparing the vertical and horizontal phase readings, uh, you can make sure that these are either in phase or 180 degrees out of phase as you look at it here, right? On this two, and the waveform will be combination of 1x and 2x and possibly other sources we also include uh, that could make this um, shafts wobble as well, okay? So the next one here is the looseness in the mounting bolts. So this is basically a looseness that caused by the foundation of this motor or a pump or this complete assembly, right? So when you look at this looseness, some of the symptoms include it can be on the rotating and non-rotating machinery as well. So the causes could be excessive bearing clearances or the loose mounting bolts or the mounting bolts that gets loose and over a period of time due to excessive vibration as well. And also sometimes if you use the mismatched components or if you don't use the proper torque values for these bolts, that can lead to uh, this looseness on the foundations as well. So this, uh, on the top you see the parallel soft foot and then the right you have the angular soft foot where this one foot is protruding up and then the foundation based on the bottom here, uh, the different uh, planes of this, okay? So if you don't use the proper foundation methods that can lead to uh, premature bearing failures as well. So this one shows a difference between a structural and rotational, how these waveforms will look like on the spectrum, right? So this is uh, the one on the structural, if you look at the one X is dominant, whereas on the rotating one, the major difference is one X and then there's a lot of other things, which is more like the harmonics that's been created uh, by this uh, rotating uh, situation because of this rotating looseness that's creating all this variations of 4x, 5x, 6x, and that's not all uniform. Unless there is an impacting, in which case there'll also be harmonics in this uh, other situations too, okay? So structural looseness will often have one component vibrating, for example, uh, the foot of the motor or on the uh, one, sta one stationary part of the foundation that's uh, making that. Whereas on the rotating vibration, excessive clearance is in the bearing or the rolling element bearings that will produce the harmonics at uh, one X turning speed that can extend about 10 X as well, okay? So what you see here is one X all the way to nine X that can go further than that as well. So rotating looseness will normally generate a large number of harmonics and may cause the noise flow to rise. And uh, the waveform will show an impacting, uh, quite obvious in the time waveform as I show here, it is best to use the units of acceleration for this kind of uh, uh, measurement. So when looking at this looseness because of the rotating failure or the fault, you are, you're better off doing an acceleration measurement using G's, this mm per uh, second square uh, thing, okay? So the next one is the looseness as it applies to the pillar block. This is more like the foundational uh, looseness caused by the cracks and the bearing pedestals. So there are this, the huge power generation equipment where you have this shaft that extends longer and then they'll have this pillow type bearings that's put in between to support those. And if you see any kind of a foundational issues with the pillow block itself, that will create this kind of a noise here. So you can see the 1X, 2X and 3X, where specifically here you see in this uh, image, the dominant uh, 2X band here, right? So that shows you there is something that's going in between the coupling as well, okay? So this could be, as I mentioned, because of uh, few reasons. One is the bearing pedestals are broken or it has the faulty isolators in between. And uh, normally the spectrum will have the components 1X, 2X, and 3X, but uh, you will not see harmonics. Interesting, that's what uh, it's showing here. You will not, not normally see the harmonics as for the previous previous case of the rotational fault, okay? So loose rotor on the shaft is again another fault uh, which shows a high 1X and the harmonics, as you see, the two, three, and four are the harmonics, and the dominant one X is the one here we see it, right? So primarily you see the visual indication that rotor slips out of the shaft, 
or uh, usually intermittently depending on the temperature, and this causes severe vibration at uh, 1x speeds, okay? So, and also it can be caused because of the abrupt changes in the load or also the change in the voltage, which can uh, change this condition as well. So, look for the signs of looseness and sliding motion when you see this on the motor end, and also look for the uh, signs that the fault may be intermittent that cannot be present all the time. So it just comes and goes, and the uh, rotor bar slides in and out at times. That's a clear indication from this waveform, as you see it, uh, which shows you this is uh, rotor shaft fault, okay? So when you look at some of the things, so where do you set all these bands, right? So this is one of the guidelines which uh, uh, one of the uh, major automation companies, Rockwell Automation, published on their uh, instruction manual. So if you don't know where to start, these are the best ways to set your bands, like a band zero. This is a five band setting with FFTs. If you look at the alarm one, you can set it up at 405 and 6.08, and same for all these things. So this is just a guideline again, guys. And, uh, and if you want detailed uh, information about what those alarms and settings needs to be on the new machines or that specific uh, machinery of your application, you need to verify that specific manufacturer instructions. This is just for the large machines. If you're looking for a 550 band, these are the things that you can set up to, okay? But if you want more details, uh, you can look at the ISO 10816, which is more for industrial machines, about 15 kW, uh, anywhere from 120 to 15,000 RPM machines. This ISO document defines clearly what those vibration standards and similarities needs to be. And then if you're looking at the coupled machines like the uh, uh, pumps or motors or uh, uh, power generation equipment, you can look at ISO 7919, which shows you the shaft vibration where you can measure the vibration of the shaft itself. So on the image on the left shows some of the guidelines from the 10 hertz to 1000 hertz. If you see anything um, above 0.07, to 0.62, you're having a serious uh, condition with your uh, vibration on that machinery, right? So and then if you take this as a guideline, as a best case scenarios, you can set your bands accordingly and you get this uh, anomaly detections and alarm set points based on that, okay? So let's look at some of the uh, bearing faults. Uh, plain bearing fault is the simplest form of bearing. The shaft rides on the oil surface and a bushing which is self-lubricated or pressure oil fed. Uh, primarily, this is a low-speed, uh, high horsepower machinery. So this, again, goes back to the first one, less than 10 hertz. Operation is talking about using eddy current probes because you can't use anything uh, high-frequency probes to measure this type of fault. And uh, you can use it uh, on the machines with access difficult to these types and the vibration is not apparent until the fault is noticed. So it's always good to have that eddy current probes on these machines where you have the plane bearing faults. You can monitor those uh, specific faults as well, okay? <clears throat> so the next one is uh, bearing fault sensing. Here we show as, um, rolling element bearings. So where the sensor is mounted directly on the radial direction, you can put the sensor either perpendicular to that, uh, the shaft, or you can put it the parallel to the shaft, but make sure when you try to uh, take these readings, you take those positions correctly so that you can give you a wrong reading, okay? So sensors mounted close to the bearing, so it's monitoring the uh, uh, vibration signatures of that specific bearing. And then again, you can go, if you want to really, really look at uh, early stage warnings of these bearings, you need to go at the uh, high frequency uh, options on these uh, sensors as well, okay? In some cases, this amount on the axial direction as well, which is parallel to the shaft, and uh, this range can go from anywhere 500 to 16,000 hertz range as what the acceleration is uh, related, okay? So this is a specific uh, bearing fault progression where you uh, look at this elevated GSE or spike energy, right? So this is excited bearing natural frequencies, and the bearing natural frequencies are typically, as I mentioned, one kilohertz to two kilohertz, and the discrete fault frequencies, as I mentioned here, uh, bearing fault is indicated when the measurement is elevated. So these are the things you can't uh, say it using a low frequency uh, option of the vibration sensors. You need to have the high frequency option, which can show you the inner uh, bearing failures as well, okay? So this is a pump cavitation or a loose spot detection in the pump. This can be detected using a standard FFT band measurement. But again, this requires a high frequency. 
uh, observed frequencies excited when the cavitating of the pump. If you don't notice this, and if you can't catch this failure or something that's happening around this, you can totally damage your pump or a motor, and which can uh, totally shut down the equipment or it can fail the entire system, okay? So design measures short duration pulses. So that's what the GSC or a spike energy, which gives you that specific spikes whenever there's a cavitation in the pump. You can detect those using the specific bands and then you can make a corrective action accordingly, okay? So let's quickly go to the next slide and look at some of the options, what we do. So I'm gonna talk about a few things, what we offer at GraySense as far as the uh, sensing capabilities. What you see on the screen here is our uh, wireless vibration temperature sensor, which is a MEMS-based sensor, uh, triaxial, and then you can mount it as I'm showing it. You can do it, you can position it on your uh, radial, or you can also position it on the axial. It can also support the epoxy or a magnetic mount. And uh, next, we go to the next slide, we can look at basically uh, the vibration sensor and it have, we have the panel mount node, which can communicate from the vibration sensor uh, using the 802.15.4 protocol, uh, which is within the 30 meters or 100 feet line of sight. And from there, you can have multiple options, either going through a cloud gate or through a Wi-Fi network. And the best part about it is you can also uh, see all those anomalies using the uh, maintenance hub protocol, which is most like uh, where you can see all these parameters on a single dashboard where you can uh, uh, configure them and you can look at the anomalies uh, and get status notifications as something uh, goes wrong on the system, okay? So these are the field mount nodes. So uh, three axis acceleration, it be compatible, and these are IP65 rated, and you'll take the OTA or the air updates and the wireless range, as I mentioned before, this can go up to uh, 30 meters, okay? Uh, these are currently offered up to, uh, as I was looking through that, these are up to 1,000 hertz and 800 hertz only, and we're developing something that takes care of the high frequency pulse that can go up to uh, uh, 1,600 or 2,500 kilohertz range as well in the future. We're just uh, working on those options. And here, what you see is the panel mount node. The panel mount node is the one that sits on your panel where you can, uh, uh, take the other parameters of the specific machinery, for example, you can take uh, you can take the uh, voltage or the frequency uh, drops or the power monitoring and all this and bring it to the single dashboard where you can look at not just the vibration uh, sensing alone, you can also look at the other things that are related to that specific uh, piece of equipment, right? You can bring in the accelerometers, RTDs, and we also support uh, the modular cards where you can bring in the other third-party devices and integrate with our equipment as well, okay? So the special analytics for Grace and Hotspot Monitor also provided on those things. So we have another device, which is a hotspot monitor for temperature anomaly detection. You can tie that back to the same system and get all the details on a uh, single screen, okay? So here is the architecture. As you look at it, uh, this is the vibration node. It's communicating using a 802.15.4 Zigbee protocol to this uh, panel node and the other trans transducers on this, you can bring it all together here and you can communicate to this maintenance hub uh, using a Wi-Fi or an LTE module option, okay? So the, we also support the DCS or SCADA system using a wired and also through an API using uh, uh, the same system as well. Using on-prem solution, we can work with an API and connect it to your SCADA system and DCS. And uh, we normally recommend using it for monitoring function, not for controlling functions, so that uh, if there is any kind of a problem, one thing is you're gonna get a false response that someone is gonna look at this piece of equipment, not going to turn something else on or off based on this readings, okay? And this will be coming in the fall where you're also coming up with uh, Ethernet and the MAR, MARBUS protocol, that wires to your uh, plant which CAD system for you to look at it, taking all these parameters on a single screen, okay? So this is the uh, the web interface. We call it uh, maintenance hub now. It's not a decision workshop. There's more like a tree structure where you can go and configure all this, use the defined values on your accelerometers or your temperatures or your monitoring systems on your uh, panel, for example, uh, your frequency or voltage or power monitoring and everything comes up to this specific one feed through which you can make uh, uh, email notifications or text messages to your maintenance personnel if there is an anomaly detection. So again, all this, what you're doing here is a condition-based monitoring. 
So if there is a preset value and the system exceeds that preset value, automatically it sets, sends your uh, maintenance person a warning or a signal alerting them to take a corrective action. So it's not going to do anything artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning along those lines, okay? And this is one of the waveforms we're trying to show here, the temperature comparison that's uh, taken out from the temperature probe and also an onboard thermistor where you can look at the patterns. And uh, the web interface allows you further to download this data using a uh, CSV file or an XLS file format for you to go and trend this data over time to understand if there is any correlation between multiple parameters, okay? So this is alert notification where uh, I mentioned about the system also has a remediation steps built into it where a user can go and configure all those uh, um, remediation instructions based on the specific uh, fault criteria like what the safety uh, methods needs to be or what tools or spares is required to uh, uh, perform a maintenance on that specific piece of equipment based on that specific anomaly detection and then go from there. Okay, so some of the applications what we see is uh, mostly induction motors, DC motors, or uh, any common type motor that's um, in the uh, low and high power range. Uh, so one sensor per bearing for the motors is what is recommended by Rockwell, which is up to 500 horsepower, and so two sensors per bearing for anything that's larger than 500. So you need to make the determination what different values you're trying to measure and what those lines are, is it on the radio, a direction is an axial position or where you want to measure. And also, again, as I mentioned before, make sure that uh, you go and position those sensors on your, when you're setting the set points that you access is also correctly so that uh, you don't get the wrong readings too, okay? So again, this is a fan and blower application uh, where you can use this. You can put one on this uh, pillow block or you can put one on this motor housing and also on the fan as well. So again, uh, the current product offering, what we do are primarily aimed at uh, low frequency applications up to 1000 Hertz, but we're also developing something uh, that's currently uh, the development that could uh, take the high frequency faults, more like the bearing faults and such as well, which will be coming up uh, later in the fall this year, okay? So again, the frequency bands and all our levels we talked about. So on this last one, so the low frequency levels, we must have to use the eddy current probes because not the other uh, sensors can take that, right? Anything on the mid frequency to high frequency, you can use this uh, vibration sensors, either Piaggio based or MEMS based sensors. When you're using the high frequency, make sure those have the high frequency bands built into that. So you'll be able to measure those. But when you're looking at this cavitation, uh, lubrication of the bearing early stage warnings, you need to go something that's uh, for higher frequency, which will be more expensive to detect that level of uh, faults, okay? So in summary, time waveform and spectrum analysis gives extra details about what's going on with that specific machine and uh, how these things are performing to the preset values. And the phase analysis shows you the misalignment of that specific asset. Well, the vibration analysis is a powerful tool for you to uh, for you to uh, understand what's going on with this specific machine. But uh, normally, we don't recommend you to completely rely on just the vibration signature. That's what we mentioned, the other techniques that you can use, like the motor current uh, signature analysis, or you can do the ultrasound for your regular uh, frequent inspections. And also, you can do the oil samples and further the temperature for the surface temperature of the motors. So when you monitor the multiple parameters and then bring it to a single dashboard, you were able to look at all these parameters pertaining to that specific machine on a more holistic way where you can compare those and do the correlation along with that and make a determination whether these are uh, really uh, the fault scenarios that requires attention or something that requires a maintenance task to be performed on that, okay? So with that, uh, I will take the questions and uh, also as you uh, exit the webinar, just make sure that you take the survey and give your feedback. I think there's a huge topic, and if you have any questions, please do reach out to me, and I'll try to answer as many questions as possible, okay? Thank you.